For those not familiar with the tragedy and loss of Dr. Isildin Abulaish, the following brief account is provided from the Daughters for Life Memorial Foundation website. In the late afternoon of January 16, 2009, Jabalia Refugee Camp, Gaza Strip. In the final days of the massive Israeli assault on Gaza that was launched in response to militants' firing of rockets into Israel, a ceasefire was expected any day. The house of Isildin Abulaish, the Palestinian doctor who worked in an Israeli hospital, was bombed by an Israeli tank. In the assault, three daughters, Besan, Meyar, and Aya, were killed. Their cousin, Nur, was killed as well. Moments after the shells landed in their home, the Abu Laish family tragedy became seared in the Israeli national conscience when Dr. Abu Laish called on a live broadcast to an Israeli television journalist pleading for help. For more information about this incident, and to find out more about the work of the Daughters for Life Foundation, please visit their website at daughtersforlife.com. And now we begin the program featuring Dr. Isildin Abulaish speaking about his book, I Shall Not Hate, A Gaza Doctor's Journey on the Road to Peace and Human Dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much to be together. But as he mentioned, I am coming to read. I am coming to speak to you with open heart, mind. Sometimes when I'm thinking, if I am an author, I am a medical doctor who used to save lives and to heal and to treat patients. That's my mission in life. And I hope each of us is coming with goodwill, with open heart, mind, eyes, and ears willing to connect, willing to know and understand. Yesterday, 17th of January, was the day of Dr. Martin Luther King. And the day before, 16th of January, was the second anniversary of my daughters. Dr. Martin Luther King, who fought for justice, freedom, dignity, And my daughters, who were daughters, girls, full of love, of hope, of education, in our lives, each of us faces challenges 
ups and downs, tragedies. But for me personally, I can say, as millions of people in this world, as a Palestinian child, born, raised in a refugee camp, as if it was written to live in poverty and deprivation and suffering for nothing I did as millions of children in this world what did they do to be suffering and deprived it's man-made man-made suffering but what can I say to you as it's man-made this is the hope you as a human being can challenge those man-made challenges of not accepting it of feeling the pain and outrage about them of feeling connected with those who are suffering and to change it and to resist it. I succeeded in my life to achieve what have I achieved as a refugee. To be educated and the most difficult time in my life was in four months period. That mountains can't bear that. And number 16 will never be erased from my mind. 16th of September 2008 is the day when I lost my wife of acute disease. I was blessed to have six lovely, beautiful daughters and two sons. Those daughters, as most of the children, are the beauty of life. They were girls full of love, full of the plans. They never succeeded in their schools. Less than 97%. Their teachers were fighting to have them in their classes. I said to myself, what can I do? Because I believe Children need the mother. The mother is the one who raises and builds. Now they lost their mother. Thanks to my daughter, Bisan, who said, you count on God and our support. You must resume your work in Israel. I continued because I learned one thing as Einstein said life is like riding a bicycle to keep balanced we must keep moving and I can't return my wife but I can do and offer my children a better future and opportunities But we don't know what will happen tomorrow. The unexpected happened 16th of January 2009 when an Israeli shell shelled my house, killing three of my daughters, niece, and severely wounding others. 
for nothing they did. Bisan, who was 20 years old, who was supposed to get her BA just a few months later. Bisan, who became the mother, the sister, the friend to take responsibility. Bisan is the one after she lost his mother, her mother said, and for you, especially for the young men and women, she said, it's not the academic exams that we face in life. They are not difficult. They are the easiest thing in life. The difficult exams in life are life exams we face. Bisan was the first girl I sent to peace camps, to know others, to connect with others. When she came, she told me after she met Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Druze, Bedouins, how similar are we? Bisan said, to meet terrorism with terrorism or violence with violence doesn't solve any problem. She said at the age of 14, everything starts small, then becomes big. Everything starts in one place, then goes in different directions. They were planning, where can I take them? Because I felt I want to be with my children. I don't want to travel and to be away from them as I used to work, to cross the borders every Sunday and to be back Thursday. I don't want to leave them. I don't want anyone to see what have I seen. Those lovely girls, you can't know them. They became parts, drowning in blood, with decapitated heads. Where is Mayar? Where is Aya? Where is Shada? Where is Gaida? Where is Noor? But as a believer, as a Muslim with deep faith, I fully believe everything from God is for God. And that this tragedy must be for good. And to behave as a medical doctor, as I used, to think of saving lives, to think of saving Shada, Gaida, and my brothers who were severely wounded. I started to think of the future. What can I do? for my children. What are they going to do? My son, who was 12 years old, is he going to be crazy, to hate the world and himself? But the message of passion, support, came from my son. When he looked at me, and to say, why are you crying? Why are you screaming? I said to myself, what is he saying? You must be happy. My sisters are happy there. They are with their mom. She asked for them. This is the 12 years old Palestinian child can we learn from our children? Can we make them the priority and offer them the life and the happiness they deserve? My daughter Shada, niece, and the brother were treated in the hospital where I used to work just two days before the craziness, I returned back. 
And the first message I want each of you to implement and to consider if I know what will happen I will never leave my daughters or children. I will spend as much as I can time with them to be with them to hug them, to kiss them to have fun with them. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. Spend as much as you can of your time kiss hug the people you love as much as you can you don't know if you are going to see them or not my daughter Shada her eye was saved to be in place in the hospital where I used to work where we treat patients without relation to medicine, that this is the name, ethnicity, religion, and that's what is needed from our leaders, from every one of us to practice. What do we practice within the borders of the hospital? And to realize one thing, that the most Holy thing in the universe is a human being and the freedom. Saving one's life, you save the world. Killing one, you kill the world. A freedom that we speak about. It's the right for everyone to be free. And we must not be any price or any cost, or to be killed to get our freedom. Because we were born free, and we must run a normal life free without any cost. Freedom is free for everyone. Someone may ask, still you didn't hate I can say to hate whom? Those holy and noble souls that I see them in front of me as they were killed for nothing they are telling me bring us justice to bring them justice it doesn't need hate or revenge. Hate is a blindness, is a disease, is a toxin. Once we are injected with it, we will never recover. We must prevent and immunize ourselves against hatred or revenge. And the antidote of hate and revenge is success to bring my daughter's success and others. My daughter Shada, who was severely wounded, she lost the sight in one eye. She was studying day and night during the war to be one of the first ten in Palestine in high school. What do I expect from her? After she spent four months in the hospital, she went back. She was determined to succeed and to go back to the school. She did the exam. And the 21st of July, they announced the result. And she succeeded, 96%. And now she is studying computer engineering at the University of Toronto. This is the challenge and success to be focused, to be determined, not to give up, and to make justice to the beloved ones. I fully believe, 
And I came here because there is hope. And that this hope to be strengthened, we must have faith and confidence in it. We need to act. The patient to be cured, he needs to take the medication. The student to succeed, he needs to work hard for hope to be achieved. We need to have faith in hope and to act. But don't underestimate your action. I don't believe in the word impossible in life. And each of us in this moving world, nothing is impossible. The only impossible thing I know is to return my daughters back. Other thing in life I planned, I achieved. And every one of us can achieve. It's a matter of action to do something. The change starts from each of us to believe in it and to do something. And I can tell you not to underestimate yourself or your action, whatever the size of your action. And the story of a young girl who was sitting on the shore when a heavy tide threw hundreds of a starfish. She is a girl with honesty, with confidence, with love. She started to throw one by one till a man came and overtook that girl and asked, what are you doing? What can, what are you doing make any difference? There are hundreds with her wisdom, with her goodwill and good heart, with evidence based. She threw another starfish and said it made a difference to that one. That's what do we need to communicate that we are a human being, we are connected. We need to defend the rights of others, not because they are others. Defending others' rights, you defend your right. Because when we were created from Adam and Eve and became nations and the tribes, for one reason, to know each other, to be connected with each other, not to know the name or face, to know the person and the humanity that we all belong to. My daughters, two weeks before they were killed, I took them to the Gaza beach they succeeded to see their names written in sand. And every now and then, a wave is coming to clean those names as if they knew they will be cleaned from life. And now their names are written in stone on the tomb. And in our life, who can see his name written in metal or in stone? Only generals, philanthropists, the poor people, they see their names in sand or in papers or after death in stone. I swore to God and to my daughters that I will never relax or rest till I meet them one day and to tell them I am coming to you with justice and your names are written in stone and metal on institutions because those girls they have plans and the dreams 
For me, I dreamed to be a medical doctor. Because no one can prevent us from dreaming. And I urge each of you to dream. Because dreams are close to reality. Our children and my children, they planned. Because they have a father who can afford and help them to achieve their plans. What about other girls in this world who have the potential but deprived of the resources? In my life, I am in debt. A proud of that to my mother, my wife, and my daughters. Without them, I will never achieve. What have I achieved? In memory of my daughters, I founded a foundation called Daughters for Life for girls and women, for health and education in the Middle East. Because a healthy, educated girl and woman will raise healthy, educated children, husband, family, community, and nation. It's not the woman's status or rights. It's the woman's role in deciding and shaping the life of the nation. I fully believe in the potential of women. As the first woman on earth turned the world upside down, I fully believe women, with the help of men, we can correct this world. It's women's role. And this can be achieved by education and only education to give the women the skills and the means to build. I want each of us also to look inside, especially men. And I'm going to read a poem which was written by an Israeli Jewish woman in memory of my daughter Bisan where love resides in memory of Bisan I long to touch you Bisan one more time to hug you to tell you how sorry I am that your mom died but now you two are gone, your smiling face, your gentle way, your softness, your non-judgmental words, your pain for your people, your way of life, your dreams, aspirations, and your hope for peace. Just days before the war, I spoke with your dad. He gave me your phone number. It's still in my car. Every day I glance at the number, seeing your name, Bisan. I wish I had spoken with you more, but I didn't have the guts. I spoke with you three days before you died. I told you that I am praying for your safety. My prayers were not heard through the shilling, the bombing, the kassams, the smoke. I feel I have been betrayed by God, by my country, by the cruelty of humanity, by the war mingers, by those who think violence is the solution. And with all of this, I have been given a gift to have spent six weeks with Shada, as a dean and Gaida. I heard no words of revenge, no hatred. I heard no anger. I heard the deep belief that peace is possible, even with this enormous loss. I have been strengthened from their strength. I am more determined from their determination. I am more at peace 
from their peacefulness. Be sad. Forgive me for not being able to save you from my own people. Forgive me for giving you hope that peace is possible and then taking that dream from you. You will always be my symbol of hope, peace, and mostly gentleness. Your dad shared the dream with me days after you died. He came into a room full of men, and there you were, sitting amongst them. He asked you, why are you sitting here, Bisan? You know it is not acceptable in our society. You answered, all is fine now, Dad. I am happy and well. I can be here now among the men where I am needed. May no other woman need to die in order to be able to influence the men as you have, Bisan. May we women be heard and heeded, and may the men in this world get the chance to know from deep within their hearts that this is where the answer lies, in their hearts where love resides. And the friends, I believe with all my heart that we all can make a difference and that we will. I believe in your potential. I believe in you. I believe in you, especially the young men and women. Have hope, have faith, and take action. And that we are all significant. Shall we begin and smash those artificial, mental and physical barriers? And to learn one thing and realize one fact that our road map should be the humanity, not the territories and our ideologies. We must avoid them and to be focused to save the suffering and the injured malformed humanity and our children are the priority and they are the future. And one thing, our enemy is our ignorance. Our enemy is our greed and arrogance. We need to get rid of our ignorance by connecting with each other and to leave here with a mission, with a mission that each of us can make a difference. Start the change with your neighbors with your people, within your family. Then you go outside. This what can we do? Always we curse the leaders. But those leaders, who brought them? We brought them. We voted for them. We need leaders who are risk takers, who are challenging to serve the humanity. We need to humanize, not to politicize. Believe me, as I see you, I see the hope. From many meetings I did, the ground is receptive for the change, and it's an opportunity to take this momentum to start the change within each of us and then between us and to share with others Life is sharing, and happiness is in sharing. At that moment, we will witness a brighter future, a peaceful world for all of us. And from my experience, a small house can fit 400 of friends, but can't fit for two fighters or ignorant or arrogant people. Let us expand and open and enlarge our minds, hearts, and eyes to fit for every one of us. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. You've been listening to Dr. Izzeldin Abulaish talking about his new book, 
I Shall Not Hate, a Gaza doctor's journey on the road to peace and human dignity. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Following the death of his three daughters and his niece, Dr. Abu Laish founded the Daughters for Life Foundation. As described at its website, this foundation provides education and health access to women and girls in Gaza and the Middle East to support their leadership development. Inspired by the doctor's values and lifetime commitment to working across challenging situations, the foundation will honor the memory of his daughters and serve as a living legacy. To find out more about the Daughters for Life Foundation and to view the memorial for Dr. Abu Laish's daughters, please visit the website at daughtersforlife.com. For further information and donation inquiries, please email foundation at daughtersforlife.com. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Approximately two-thirds into the question and answer session, the video becomes degraded and then was lost. PDX Justice Media Productions apologizes for this technical failure. We hope you will find the audio track sufficient for the conclusion of the program. Dr. Isildine Abulaish spoke at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon on January 18, 2011. The first question from the audience was whether the author was able to share this same message in both Gaza and Israel. The same message in Palestine and Israel. I can say to you, Gaza is part of the Palestinian nation. So it's not Gaza. Gaza is a city. I can say I share this, the message, Gaza and Beersheba, Gaza and Tel Aviv, Gaza and Haifa. If you believe in something, and when I came here to say it, it's in the daylight. And if you believe in something, you must go to the end of that. And I hope every one of us to stand for what did he believe in. I am proud of saying that, that I said it in Palestine, everywhere. It's not colored message. It's unicolor message for all. Yes. The next member of the audience asked what the government of Israel said to the doctor in response to this incident. I didn't speak about it. It's shame. Because 16th of January was the second anniversary. And as I said, there was no reason for my daughters to be killed. But we are good as people in justification, in blaming, instead of taking responsibility and being honest, first of all, with ourselves, because we make mistakes. And the mistake is a mistake if we didn't learn from it. Within two years, I tried in a peaceful way, every possible way, to get an apology. Knesset members, ministers, were engaged in it. And even when they were severely wounded, my daughter, niece, and the brother, they were in the hospital in Tel Aviv. And they were, there were soldiers who were injured in the war. The Israeli officials, they used to come to visit the soldiers. And I am few meters from them. But no one came to say sorry or ab we apologize for that. But believe me, I don't care. I care about the people as I am, the Israeli public. Jewish, Christians, Muslim, Druze, from everywhere. They stood up for that. But sometimes those girls, and you must feel outraged 
and every one of us, there is a law called statute of limitation. I didn't know in life that the people I love, I have to forgive them after some time. Two years statute of limitation and after which you forget the blood and the souls of those lovely daughters and the legal advisor of what do they call the IDF to say those girls they took responsibility about chilling the house but they are collateral damage they are not objects they are not tables or materials they are a human being with hearts, with minds, with souls, with the blood. And 16th of January, I have to forget them. I can't do anything for them. So I was forced, or they didn't leave any alternative, just to file a lawsuit against them, to open their eyes. We need to speak about the truth and to take responsibility. This is a window of opportunity for all of us to have the moral courage to speak loudly and to move forward. Yes. The next member of the audience offered his apology because he said his country, the United States, supports the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, and he finds no excuse for that support. He said that he thinks that all Americans owe Dr. Abu Laish personally and all Palestinians an apology. But believe me, what do I want? I don't want to see others burned by the fire that I faced. We need to prevent, not to treat. It's enough. How far do we want to go? Still the situation there is boiling. The Palestinians in Gaza Strip, they are expecting the wars. Every day, my hand is on my heart. Another tragedy will happen there. And the people in the streets there, or even in Zderot, who is going to suffer. We must get rid of this fear and this craziness. And that... There will never be peace that is just and good for one. It must be just and good for all to live in collaboration, in partnership. The dignity of the Palestinians equals the dignity of the Israelis. The safety of the Israelis and security is linked with the safety and security of the Palestinians. And they have one future and one way and they can't put an end to each other. Yes? The next member of the audience asked if the doctor felt any concern for his own safety as he travels around the world speaking about the death of his daughters at the hands of the Israeli military. This member of the audience explained that there may be people who read this book and respond by insisting that this message has to be suppressed. Of course, I can say to you, in this world, there is the good and the bad. But the majority of the people are good. And there are extreme, what do we call extreme, or a blind people. Can we leave our future as the majority to the minority? If I didn't speak loudly, you are not far away from the fire. Today I am, tomorrow the other. And it's our responsibility as a majority to defend ourselves and to speak loudly. Those minority, because they're a problem, they are noisy. And they are noisy because we are silent. And it's time to go and to speak loudly, all of us, and to learn one thing, that all of us in one boat, no one is protected. Yes. 
The next member of the audience asked the doctor if there was some part of the United States policy towards this region that he would like to see changed, something that we here in the United States could urge our representatives to work for, a change in U.S. policy that the doctor would like to see Americans working for. The policy that I want and the change from the current American administration, because all of the world, their eyes are focused to the White House. It's the compass for peace and the people, they are thinking, the change is there. And I think the Americans, from my experience, the world is a stereotype about the Americans, the people and the administration. And the, the American people, they pay the price of the administration's policies. Can we protect the nation themselves? Because the Americans themselves don't deserve this prejudice against them as a human being. And I know the interest of the American administration but at least not to be completely biased. I say it, little justice, little kindness, that's what is needed. And I am not against the Americans to support Israel. They have the right to support Israel. And we have a good saying, support your friend if he was oppressed or oppressor. I can support my friend if he is oppressed to help him to be freed. But how can I support him as a oppressor to prevent him from oppressing others, to open their eyes? The current Israeli policies is dangerous for the Americans, for the Israelis, and for the Palestinians. They want to take us back into violence, which is futile. It's futile. It will never work. The other way is to open their eyes, admit the rights of all, to translate those negotiations into action. Because peace is good to negotiate and to speak about peace. Talking is good. But for me, as a medical doctor, the patient in the morning when I come to see him, to say good morning, he's in pain. Be patient. Tomorrow we will come, we will see, we will, we will, we will. The patient at the end, he leaves the hospital. The patient, he needs a prescription to be cured, to be healed, and to leave the hospital to run a normal life. That's what is needed. From what do we call negotiation? Action on the ground. And the Americans, I fully believe, they can do that to take the risk and to challenge someone who can sacrifice his position for the human cause to be memorable at the long term. Dr. Martin Luther King, when he sacrificed his life for a noble human cause, the people will remember him and he will remain. But others, we curse the moment we heard about them. And no one will remember the good deeds of them, just the bad deeds they have. It's time to translate it into action, to say, to be honest. That's what I think the Americans, they can have that. And your vote, your vote is vital. Send and give your vote to the right people that you think they will serve your interest and the nation's interest, not to come, and after two years he will start thinking, what can I do to be re-elected? He has no time to think of you. They are working to think of themselves, to keep themselves in power and on the chair. Yes? Yes? The next member of the audience asked if there were any non-governmental organizations like Mercy Corps or Doctors Without Borders that are working in Gaza. Of course, there are a lot of humanitarian organizations working in the Palestinian Authority. 
But the human life and the human being, they are not in need of a humanitarian aid. We don't need just food. I want my freedom. Freedom of hunger, freedom of pain, of fear, of unemployment, of ignorance, freedom of movement. That's what is needed. I don't want the food. I don't want the ballast, but I want my freedom. To be homeless, but to be freedom and to be free. Yes? The next member of the audience explained that as a citizen of the United States, he has spoken with his representatives in Congress and has been very frustrated. Our representatives in Congress seem to fail to listen to the call for justice for Palestinians, and we see the Israeli government continuing its unjust policies. And so more and more people here in the United States, but also throughout the world, are heeding the call by Palestinian civil society for boycott, divestment, sanctions, the BDS campaign aimed at the state of Israel until it complies with international law. What does Dr. Abu Laish think of this approach to the struggle for justice in Palestine? No, I, I can say to you, you are practicing that. Have any one of you visited the Holy Land to see how do the Palestinians live? To leave the Palestinian Authority, I need a permit. Our electricity, from where it comes? From Israel. You are free. And if you are doing it for a good cause, to open their eyes, the Israeli public, the Israeli government, this is not the right approach. It changed your approach from goodwill. You are doing it. I appreciate that. That's what is needed because the current Israeli government with their policies, they want to trap the Palestinians in violence. And I hope the Palestinians not to be trapped. Violence has no way. Words are stronger than bullets. It's time. But you and the Jewish community in the States to speak to the Israelis to the Israeli government, please, we don't accept it. As an American Jew here, this induces harm to you. You must not understand up for justice to tell them this is not accepted. Not just to be shy, you can't uh, criticize. You criticize them from goodwill because you care about them. That's what is needed. Yes. The next member of the audience said that she had heard that Palestinian children are learning hatred too. She asked the speaker to comment on that. You learned and you heard. From where did you hear that? That's what I want. If I heard, I want to see if it's right or not. Not to be controlled by remote control. Someone to say me to me. I don't want to underestimate my thinking. I can say to you, my daughter, Rafa, and you can go to the YouTube. I was one in one of the synagogues in Toronto. It was the first time to take my children with me to an event. I never took them. As many of the Israelis and the American Jews, the Palestinians, just thinking, to see by one eye. The coin has two sides. The Palestinians, they teach their children on hate. They want them to be killed, to hate us. Kassam rockets, we left Gaza, and they don't see what did they do for the Palestinians during the war. My daughter Rafa asked me, what can we learn? Because I want to teach them. And in the event, I ask them in front of all of the people, tell them, what did I teach you? And she said to them, he taught us in Hebrew, Manishma Adi Ohevotach. How are you? I love you. Why do we think we teach our children 
on hate. No one on earth hates his children. He wants the best of his, for his children. That's the issue. Why are we stereotyped, preoccupied about the others? And this story, I can respond to you. What do you think of the settlers and the rabbis teach their people about killing the Palestinians? What are they teaching them? Tell me, please. What do you think? Are they angels? No angels in this world. That's what do we need to understand, not to blame each other. Can we even, this hate, if he hates someone, to ask him, why did he hate? There is something. Hate and violence are symptoms of a disease. They are not the disease, and we must dig deeper to treat the patient from the roots of the disease. It's a Palestinian nation and an Israeli nation. A Palestinian nation which is occupied, oppressed. Give him this freedom and there will never be hate or violence or any problems. And get rid of the fear of the Israelis. The next member of the audience said that he was pondering what an exceptional person the doctor must be. Having spent time in Israel, Dr. Abu Laish has seen how both sides feel in this conflict. There's a lot of fear and mistrust. He has seen how Palestinians and Israelis, left on their own, often get along. But at an official level, there's a lot of fear and mistrust. We see that in this country as well. This member of the audience said that he was trying to understand how the doctor came to his own way of understanding and responding to this conflict. Are you potentially a model for how we ought to be, or are you just too much of an exception to the way most people respond to this kind of conflict? I don't think that I am exceptional. I am as you, as every one of you. And if each of us started to think in a rational way what is good, for yourself and for others, we can be, we are the same, and we are similar. What's the difference? Do you accept violence? Of course, no. Do you want to be happy? Yes. To be successful, to have a brighter future for you, for your children, that's what do we want to promote and to start. I am not exceptional, each of us, just to think and to give himself the moment to think rationally and what is good and what is bad. Yes? The next member of the audience asked what the doctor's medical specialty is and whether the hospitals in Gaza are adequately supplied and what communication is like within the medical establishment between Israeli doctors and Palestinian doctors. I got my MD from Cairo University. I worked in Saudi Arabia for a few years and then specialized in obstetrics and gynecology from the University of London. In 91, I started as the first Palestinian doctor to practice in an Israeli hospital, where the Israelis used to see the Palestinians as workers, and now to see the Palestinian as a medical doctor. I got the Israeli board in obstetrics and gynecology and specialized in infertility and IVF. Then I changed to do a subspecialty in fetal medicine and genetics. After that, I said I need the policy and managerial skills in our field. So I did a master in health policy and management from Harvard University. I practiced there the situation in the Palestinian hospitals in Gaza, the Gazans are traumatized, stressed. And the hospitals there, they can't deal with tertiary medical cases, with emergencies. So if you go, for example, to one of the hospitals in Tel Hashomer, the children's hospital, 30 or 40 percent of the children there are Palestinians. They are treated 
to get referral from the Palestinian Authority to pay for their treatment to Israeli hospitals. There is, at the ground level, there is something. But you need the political, whatever the grassroots and the ground is ready, you need the decision from up. You prepare the ground to accept any political decision so they don't reject any agreement. And what is the value of treating any Palestinian patient in an Israeli hospital to send them back to Gaza with the struggle of the financial commitment of the permits? Maybe I go to cross or not to follow up. It's a disaster. The sustainability of the situation is important. And most of the Gazans, either they go to Israel, to Egypt or Jordan. And all of the borders, they have their own problems. And Gaza Strip, 50% of it, to those who doesn't know, 1.5 million people in Gaza Strip living in 360 square kilometer. It's the most densely populated area in the world. 50% of them are children. 20% are women in their productive age. So the majority of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, women and the children. I can say it's a human crisis. It's a tragedy against the humanity. It's a children. And we have to ask ourselves, why do those children hate or become crazy or tomorrow to become what do we call extremist? Have we asked ourselves, no one of us is born to be extremist. We are born a human with hearts, but the environment in which we live pushes us to adopt any change, to be extreme, to be good, to be bad. And we need to prevent before it becomes irreversible situation. The next member of the audience observed that the doctor has written this important memoir addressing an English-speaking audience. He asked if there were plans for both a Hebrew and Arabic translation of the book so that populations, both in Israel and within the Palestinian Authority, could begin their own discussion based on the tragedy of the doctor's family. It's good. What do you think I thought of? And I can say to you, assure you, the book is translated into 15 languages. Yes, February, it will be released in Hebrew. March in Arabic worldwide, English, German, Italian, Spain. It's not for the Palestinians and Israelis. It's a human message for every one of us because each of us has his own conflict. We face tragedies. It's for everyone to stand up and to move forward, to give hope for everyone. So the book next month, in Stimaski, in Tel Aviv, you can find it. And in most of the Arab countries, Arabic worldwide. Yes. The next member of the audience said that he looked through the book and he was reminded of a couple things related to the author's message on violence and hatred. In particular, Obama's last speech about the Arizona massacre, the recent shootings that killed six people, including a nine-year-old girl and a federal judge, and seriously wounded a member of Congress. Obama's speech seemed to be in line with the message of the doctor's book. It's good, you know, the speech of President Obama, but he is in a position. I am a human being, I am a person. I can't protect myself if someone is doing harm to me. But he's a president, he is there to act. His words can be translated into action. That's what is needed. We, we are not, we, I can decide at my family level. But he can decide for the whole world. And his words, what did he say? I hope and we pray to be translated into action. Because he is there to act and to change. What is this? 
Yes. The next member of the audience asked about the difficulties faced by Palestinians, described by Dr. Abu Laish, of commuting into Israel from the Palestinian territories. She asked how many Palestinian doctors are practicing in Israel. Palestinians? Yes. No, from the Gaza Strip, you, there is no Palestinian doctors, or very few who go there for a training or from organizations. But to practice there, there is no Palestinian doctors. From the Jer East Jerusalem, there are Palestinians because they have the Israeli ID, and they are, I don't know what to say, if they are Israeli citizens or what you consider them, but they can practice in Israeli hospitals, in Hadassah, and other hospitals. Yeah, there is, you know, the policies, because even there from Jerusalem, they don't need permits to cross to Israel. But Gazans, you need to cross to Israel, you need a permit. The next question, which refers to the Israeli author David Grossman, requires some additional background. David Grossman is a renowned Israeli novelist who has become a strong critic of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and of the Israeli treatment of Palestinians. Although Grossman was initially supportive of the 2006 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, he was later critical of the conduct of the war. Two days before a ceasefire in this conflict, David Grossman's son, Uri Grossman, was killed in southern Lebanon. At the time of his death, Uri Grossman was a staff sergeant on active duty as part of an Israeli Defense Forces operation in southern Lebanon. Uri Grossman was killed when his tank was hit by an anti-tank missile in southern Lebanon. The question from a member of the audience at Powell's Books was as follows. If the Israeli author, David Grossman, were to come to Gaza in the way that you, Dr. Abu Laish, have come to us here in Portland, here in Portland, the doctor is embraced. But if David Grossman, who, this member of the audience suggested, has suffered the same loss as Dr. Abu Laish, were to travel to Gaza, would he be welcomed in Gaza? Would he be heard in Gaza? Yes. He goes to the West Bank and he goes to East Jerusalem, to everywhere. And I want to ask you the question. He's my friend, David Grossman. Yes, but we need to ask why. And as other people, they ask me, are you safe in Gaza? Do you say this message in Gaza? We need to ask why the Gazans think in that way. And David can't go to Gaza. Why? Why? So will you invite me to Gaza? I am asked, most welcome, as an American to come to Gaza. I'm coming February 14th. Most welcome, I assure you, to stay at my home as my guest, my best guest, if you get a permit from the Israeli government. Most welcome, I assure you, it's not more our house, our hearts are open to everyone to come to our houses. Just even the Americans, not the American Jews. The Americans who are non-Jewish, let them come to Gaza. They are not allowed. Who prevents them? Do you know who? Please, say that, please. We don't want to speak quietly if we didn't listen. The Israeli government. They don't want the Palestinians and others to communicate. Let the Palestinians meet with the Israelis. I can meet David Grossman in the States, but we can't meet in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem because I need a permit to go there. And he needs a permit to come to Gaza from the Israeli government, and they don't want that. That's what do you need to understand and to go there to experience what is happening. Not to blame, to say, if he comes just superficial, we need to dig deeper to know the truth and the reality, what is going on the ground. The next member of the audience described how, years ago, he had met a Palestinian who was traveling on a Palestinian passport issued by the United Nations. 
Do they still issue Palestinian passports to Palestinians living in refugee camps? If not, why not? And does the doctor travel on a Palestinian passport? I travel on a Palestinian passport. Whereas I can show you. Do you have one? No, it's my, I have my passport. I will show you. Believe me, this is... No, where is my suitcase? It's there. No, I want... I have even my ID. The Israeli ID where the Israeli number is there. And I... Please, if I, the suitcase. And I will show you. I have a Palestinian passport from the Palestinian Authority. And when I travel everywhere... They started in the immigration, in the passports, to look. What is this? Where? And to start to look at it, to find the code. Where is the country code? Palestine is not a state. What can they do? In this passport, he has a passport. You can't find in any passport in the world your ID number written there. And you know what is the meaning of ID number? That you are Palestinian from the West Bank or the Gaza Strip who were living there and calculated with the statistics after the Israeli occupation in 1967 and you were committed to travel one year and to come back. If you don't have that ID number, any Palestinians outside, he doesn't have this passport. And this, it's interesting, you know, this is black, the Palestinian passport. And this is the old Palestinian passport, it was for three years. And then they started to expand it to be for five years, so it became black. And this is the Palestinian ID. I am sure you are an Israeli and you know in Hebrew. It's in Hebrew. Because they have to be recognized and read. The Palestinian Authority in Arabic and in Hebrew. The ID number in Arabic and in Hebrew. So please, still, we are not free. And we need each of us to think of that and to think of another nation who is not free, and just looking for his freedom, not the humanitarian aid or the food. I need to go to any place. My passports are full of visas. And sometimes it takes me three months or four months to get a visa. And it may be rejected. Because I am Palestinian. Imagine this moment about the hate. If you like yourself, why am I living? Why am I suffering? That's what do we need to put ourselves in the place of others. And if we accept it for ourselves, to accept it for others. That's what is needed. Other questions? Yes? The next member of the audience asked where the doctor saw sources of hope in Gaza. She observed that the doctor has done some work around ways for coping with the stress of life in Gaza and asked him to discuss that work and where people might find hope in spite of the challenges and tragedies that they face living in Gaza. For the situation in Gaza, you can deal with it within the general situation, the peace process between the Palestinians and the Israelis, not in a fragmented way. And what is needed first to stabilize the situation, to give peace of mind to the people there, and to take actions to show them their life is worth to live that they deserve the life. And believe me, there are people there. Gaza Strip has the highest number of PhD graduates, but they are unemployed. 
universities. I am proud of being Palestinian, and many of them, thousands, they have the potential to succeed and to give them, but give them the freedom and the hope. And you see what can they do to help others and to share with others and make a difference in the humanity. That's what is needed. You need action in the peace process, that there is a Palestinian nation and an Israeli nation. And to implement on the ground, this passport must be changed to be written a Palestinian state, not Palestinian authority where they have no control. On any, President Abbas, if he wants to leave, he needs a permit from the Israeli IDF. That's what do we need to understand. He can't cross from one city in the West Bank to the other without the permission of the IDF. We need to get rid of those barriers and to give freedom for all. You don't imagine, go there and you will see. I would love my Israeli friends to go and see and to open their eyes and to take care about both sides. I speak loudly, I condemn rockets and violence, but also I would like the Israelis to stand up to say we condemn military approaches and suffering of the Palestinians. That's what is needed, because it's our life as Palestinians and Israelis. Yes? The next member of the audience asked if art was alive in Gaza. She asked if the doctor knew much about the art world in Gaza. She said she believed that art can save us. Believe me, you know, if I, I feel hopeful, optimistic, especially in this world, moving, you don't know what will happen tomorrow. But we need to act and to do. If I came to ask you five years ago, I dreamed by night the president of the states will be a black guy called Barack Hussein Obama. What are you going to say to me? The Americans, have any American dreamed one day that the president of the states will be black called Barack Hussein Obama? This combination, what do you think? What can you say? Who is the president now? But I think, I admire him that he was determined and he dreamed to be a president and he worked for that and he was confident and he achieved that. Look around you, nothing impossible. Just in May, last May, the World Cup. Who got the World Cup? Spain. And the first, what do we call, the G8 in football were kicked out. Be confident. Be determined, focused, believe me, nothing is impossible. And this world can be changed as I see you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Dr. Izzeldin Abulaish talking about his new book, I Shall Not Hate, A Gaza Doctor's Journey on the Road to Peace and Human Dignity. Following the death of his three daughters and his niece, Dr. Abu Laish founded the Daughters for Life Foundation. To find out more about the Daughters for Life Foundation and to view the memorial, please visit the website at daughtersforlife.com. For further information and donation inquiries, please email foundation at daughtersforlife.com. And once again, PDX Justice Media Productions apologizes for the degraded and lost video track in the final segment of this presentation. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org and write to us with your comments and questions at pdxjustice at riseup.net. Thanks for tuning in, 
And thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media. Thank you. Thank you so much to be together. But as he mentioned, I am coming to read. I am coming to speak to you with open heart, mind, Sometimes when I'm thinking, if I am an author, I am a medical doctor who used to save lives and to heal and treat patients. That's my mission in life. And I hope each of us is coming with goodwill, with open heart, Mind, eyes, and ears willing to connect, willing to know and understand. Yesterday, 17th of January, was the day of Dr. Martin Luther King. And the day before, 16th of January, was the second anniversary of my daughters. Dr. Martin Luther King, who fought for justice, freedom, dignity, for those not familiar with the tragedy and loss of Dr. Isildin Abulaish, the following brief account is provided from the Daughters for Life Memorial Foundation website. In the late afternoon of January 16, 2009, Jabalia Refugee Camp, Gaza Strip. In the final days of the massive Israeli assault on Gaza that was launched in response to militants' firing of rockets into Israel, a ceasefire was expected any day. The house of Isildin Abulaish, the Palestinian doctor who worked in an Israeli hospital, was bombed by an Israeli tank. In the assault, three daughters, Besan, Meyar, and Aya, were killed. Their cousin, Nur, was killed as well. Moments after the shells landed in their home, the Abu Laish family tragedy became seared in the Israeli national conscience when Dr. Abu Laish called on a live broadcast to an Israeli television journalist pleading for help. For more information about this incident, and to find out more about the work of the Daughters for Life Foundation, please visit their website at daughtersforlife.com. And now we begin the program featuring Dr. Isildin Abulaish speaking about his book, I Shall Not Hate, A Gaza Doctor's Journey on the Road to Peace and Human Dignity. and my daughters who were daughters, girls 
full of love, of hope, of education. In our lives, each of us faces challenges, ups and downs, tragedies. But for me personally, I can say, as millions of people in this world, as a Palestinian child, born, raised in a refugee camp, as if it was written to live in poverty and deprivation and suffering for nothing I did as millions of children in this world what did they do to be suffering and deprived it's man-made man-made suffering but what can I say to you as it's man-made, this is the hope. You, as a human being, can challenge those man-made challenges of not accepting it, of feeling the pain and outrage about them, of feeling connected with those who are suffering and to change it and to resist it. I succeeded in my life to achieve what have I achieved. As Einstein said, life is like riding a bicycle to keep balanced, we must keep moving. And I can't return my wife, but I can do and offer my children a better future and opportunities. But we don't know what will happen tomorrow. The unexpected happened 16th of January 2009 when an Israeli shell shelled my house killing three of my daughters niece and severely wounding others for nothing they did Bisan, who was 20 years old, who was supposed to get her BA just a few months later. Bisan, who became the mother, the sister, the friend to take responsibility. Bisan is the one, after she lost his mother, her mother, said, and for you, especially for the young men and women. She said, it's not the academic exams that we face in life. They are not difficult. They are the easiest thing in life. The difficult exams in life are life exams we face. Bisan was the first girl I sent to peace camps to know others, to connect with others. When she came, she told me after she met as a refugee, to be educated and the most difficult time in my life was in four months period. That mountains can't bear that. And number 16 will never be erased from my mind. 16th of September 2008 is the day when I lost 
my wife of acute disease. I was blessed to have six lovely, beautiful daughters and two sons. Those daughters, as most of the children are the beauty of life, they were girls full of love, full of the plans. They never succeeded in their schools. Less than 97 percent. Their teachers were fighting to have them in their classes. I said to myself, what can I do? Because I believe children need the mother. The mother is the one who raises and builds. Now they lost their mother. Thanks to my daughter Bisan, who said, you count on God and our support. You must resume your work in Israel. I continued. Because I learned one thing.